In this video, we're going to go back to August the 31st, 1888, the day of what is widely believed to have been the first murder carried out by Jack the Ripper. It was around 3.40 that morning that Charles Cross, or Charles Lechmere, as we now know his name to have been, was making his way along Bucks Row in Whitechapel on his way to work, when in a gateway he saw what he at first took to be a tarpaulin lying on the ground. He thought it might prove useful for a cover for his wagon, so he went to inspect it, but then saw that it was a woman. It transpired that her name was Mary Nichols, and she was the first victim of Jack the Ripper. Obviously, by the time Charles Cross got there, the killer had fled the scene. And the question we're going to ask in this video is, what was his escape route from Bucks Row? And to help me with this, I'm joined by Steve Blomer, author of Inside Bucks Row. Hello, Steve. Hello, Richard. Nice to see you. And you as well. So, so let's just paint a picture. What Charles Cross, or Charles Lechmere, as we now know his name was, He's walking on his way to work along Bucks Row when he finds the body in that gateway. Can you just give us an idea of what that section of Bucks Row would have looked like that morning when he walked along it? It's a very narrow part, probably the narrowest part of Bucks Row. Uh, it'd be very dark. Uh, there's a light bit further on, but how good that was, we're not quite sure. So it'd be, it would have been very dark. Um, Contrary to what is often said, that there were no easy escape routes, which implies there are no escape routes to some people, there actually were many, many possible escape routes. OK, so just, just looking at Bucks Row first, though, we, we've got that line of cottages on the left-hand side as he's walking along. And he was on the opposite side of the road to those, wasn't he? So that side had warehouses on it, didn't it? Yes, yes. there are warehouses on the right-hand side, and then as you get almost opposite to uh, Brown's Yard, which is where the body was, you have Essex Wharf opposite at, as well. Then you get the railway bridge and then you carry on walking. You get to the school, and then it opens up. Bucks Road really opens up, much like it does today now that they've finished the work there. Uh, it's remarkable just how big Bucks Row actually looks today when you walk down Derwood Street. You suddenly come to what was then the Great Eastern Square, which is now open again, and you realise just why demonstrations often started in Bucks Row, because there's a massive area there. Yeah, because that square was popular for protest meetings and uh, protest talks as well. Yeah, and you understand that now. So the, the, the bit where the actual body was itself, that was a very narrow part of Bucks Row, probably the narrowest part of Bucks Row, probably the less, least well-lit part of Bucks Row as well. And then, and then it opens up uh, in front of the at the board school, which is the only building to have survived. Then you've got, is it Thomas Street you've got next on the, on the right? What you have, you have to the south, you have um, Woods Buildings, Court Street, Thomas Street, then you go further along and Bucks Row became then White's Row, which led out into Baker's Row. On the northern side, after the school, you had Queen Anne Street. Then you had the northern leg of Thomas Street further on. And then to the other side of the board school, so uh, the other side going south from where the murder was, you've got, uh, Winth is it Winthrop, Winthrop Street's there, isn't it? That's where the... There's Winthrop Street, which goes back on itself. There's Winthrop Street. Off of Winthrop Street, you've got Nelson Court right at the far end by Brady Street. You've then got Woods Woods Buildings, which which went across the district line. You then have Court Street and Thomas Street, and they're, they're all and they all go off Bucks. They all lead off Bucks Row. So that that's the area, and it was it was quite dark as well. So we know that Charles Lechmere or Charles Cross is on his way to work. He's walking along that first section when he sees something in the gateway. And his first thought, it's a tarpaulin. It might make a useful cover for his wagon. Uh, so he approaches it and he discovers it's a woman lying on the ground. Now, we, we won't go into all. We've done previous videos going into great detail about what happened next with him and Robert Paul. But let's just uh, go back a few minutes before Charles Cross was walking along Bucks Row and the murder's taken place. How long before he came along there do you think the murder took place? 
it's an impossible thing to quantify. Um, despite what people claim, you can't pinpoint when the attack took place from the injuries or from the bleeding. The best we can probably say is sometime, well, we've got a, a, that wide window from quarter past three until the time which Lechmere and the Robert Paul arrive. I would say probably within five minutes or so of Lechmere arriving. It may even have been as short as two minutes, minute and a half. Escaping from there was not difficult if you wanted to. It was dark. You could easily just walk away and not be seen. Of course, there are some who say that he he didn't escape yes. uh, because Lechmere was the murderer. Yes, but uh, but let's let's just let's just imagine that he wasn't, and let's just imagine that the killer. Do you think Lechmere or Cross disturbed the killer? It possibly. It's also possible, of course, that one of the local residents may have disturbed the killer. We have one in particular, a Harriet. Silly, who says that she hears a noise, uh, some noises outside, round about 3.30 approximately, but the time's, you know, any time between 3.30 and the body being found. She hears some whispers, she hears some gasping. Uh, it could be that she actually looks out of, the, of her house, could be as a candle inside, curtain could move, ray of light could come out. So it could be either a resident disturbs um, the killer, if it's not Lechmere, or Lechmere disturbs the killer. I think it's it's probably one of the two. And Harriet, Harriet Lilly lived in those cottages on, on the left? She lived uh, next door to Mrs Green, lived in the cottage right next door to where the murder was, and Harriet Lilly lived next door. So Mrs Green's is the one where you've got that window on the side of the houses? Yes. Okay, yeah, and that's the yard. So the the yard was beneath her window, and the gateway was just to the side. Just of to the side, just 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 to the side. Yes, the gateway was part of her cottage. In 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 reality, it went the the yard backed onto her cottage. It, it backed onto her her cottage, and the gateway is, is directly, as you look at it, to the, the right of her front door. And opposite was Essex Wharf, where um, Walter Perkis and his wife were, were probably awake at the time the murder took place. Yes, and apparently there was also um, another night watchman, a floor higher up than, 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 than they were. And so you've got that, that area. So the murder's taken place. Lechmere approaches and finds the body, by which time the killer has gone. He's fled the scene. So. The question is, wh which way did he flee? Just, I'll, can I just quote from the, the coroner when he, when he sums up at the inquest? Uh, let's just put that, uh, this is a quote from uh, Win Edwin Baxter, the coroner. It seems astonishing at first thought that the culprit could have escaped detection, for there must surely have been marks of blood about his person. If, however, blood was principally on his hands, the presence of so many slaughterhouses in the neighbourhood would make the frequenters of this spot familiar with bloodstained clothes and hands, and his appearance might in that way have failed to attract attention while he passed from Bucks Row in the twilight into Whitechapel Road and was lost sight of in the morning market traffic. So this is the coroner, Win Edwin Baxter, saying this at the inquest into her death. Yes, he's suggesting that the killer flees south, which is a, a fair assumption. It's not the only assumption. It's not the only possibility. That's a fair assumption. And, of course, you've got a slaughterhouse almost directly the other side of Brown's yard itself in Winthrop Street. It's, it's not exactly opposite. It's a, few, it's a few yards further to the east, but it's on the other side of Brown's yard. So you've got a big small house there. Right. So let's start looking at the ways he could have gone then. So Okay. We we'll start with we we'll start with the easy ways, first of all. He could have, in theory, popped into one of the other houses in Bucks Row. Um, that's one possibility. He could, in theory, have popped into the into Brown's yard itself. I think it's highly unlikely. But he could have popped into Brown's yard if he heard someone approaching. Um, it wasn't checked until it wasn't checked. It was locked until the police got there. 
So it's possible that someone was hiding in Brown's yard while Lechmere and Paul are checking the body at the other side of the gate. I think it's highly unlikely, but it's another one of those possibilities you, you've got to consider, I think, and then say, no, it's, it's highly unlikely. Um, there's another option which some people have proposed that there somehow there was an exit at the back of Brown's yard and that he went through the, through the yard. Now, there's no evidence on any maps that there was ever an exit on there. But if there was, then he could have gone out into Winthrop and either gone east or west. But I think it's very unlikely. Just just to go back to Brown's Yard quickly, do we actually know that were the gates of Brown's Yard open or, or locked at the time? When the police examined it, they said they were locked. They said it was locked. What we don't know, of course, is was it lockable from the inside or the outside or both? And if there was a killer in there, hiding in there, and the gates opened inwards, um, they could have heard Lechmere and Paul come, come in and quickly gone inside. But I think it's very unlikely. So shall we go to sensible escape routes then? Yes. Well, obviously, if you go straight along to the board school, this is the important bit. The board school is, get my distances right here. The board school is, is less than 50 yards from the murder site. Now, if Robert Paul is seen by Lechmere at around 40 yards, then just walking normally, you could be out of sight before Robert, Robert Paul even gets to the gate almost. <clears throat> so once you get to, to the um, board school, you could head south. And is it possible, Was do we know again, it, was the board school open? Were there any doors of the board school he could have escaped into? Because that's quite a big building. We, yes, we don't know. That's a possibility. And actually, I've never considered that. That's going into the book <laughs> as a new option. So we get to the board school. And if the killer turns south, the first thing he comes to is Winthrop Street. Now, escape routes from Winthrop Street. He could, in theory, just walk straight back Winthrop Street, along Winthrop Street, all the way and go whichever way he wanted from there. He could go two thirds of the way along and turn down Nelson Court, which leads out onto Whitechapel Road. Or he could go across Woods Building, uh, which everyone referred to as Piss Alley, and actually escape that way onto Whitechapel Road. That's all turning left at Winthrop. If he turns right at the bottom of the board school, um, he comes to Court Street, which takes him down onto Whitechapel Road. If he carries further along, he, oh, further along west, he comes to Thomas Street. Uh, after Thomas Street, of course, he carry on, leave Buck's Row as was, and enter White's Row. Comes to Baker's Row, and he can turn south at Baker's Row uh, again onto the Whitechapel Road, or he can turn north, and he could go either via Old Montague. He could walk right up Baker's Row, or he could turn down uh, Hanbury Street if he wanted to. The options, for, once you get there, are enormous. Um, if we're then coming on the northern side, he could walk down Bucks Row, get to Queen Anne Street, walk up Queen Anne Street. At the end of Queen Anne Street's a dead end, but I think it was possible to have jumped onto the railway lines if he wanted, because they, they were fairly level ground at that stage and gone across the railway tracks if, if, if he wanted to. Um, he could have turned halfway off of, uh, halfway up Queen Anne Street along what was called Cross Street into Thomas Street. Um, or he could have turned into Elizabeth Place, which is also off of um, Queen Anne Street. Now that's a dead end, but of course it's nice to say that he wasn't, he didn't have a bolt hole there. Those are all possible places he could have gone to. If you carry on west from Queen Anne Street, you come to Thomas Street. He can then either go, he can then go straight up Thomas Street and then he, he, he can turn left at the top and he, he's out into Baker's Row. The same applies to if he had gone via Queen Anne Street and taken Cross Street, he could then have gone further up and round. There, there are so many possibilities. We also have the more unlikely possibilities. Um, 
while I said that some of the others were unlikely, these are the really unlikely ones, there's a possibility that, that some have suggested that he got down the embankment onto the district line and then walked along the line. I think that's highly unlikely, but still practical just about. What's really not practical is the idea that he jumped from the murder site over the wall, jumped down onto the north-south railway line, which was some distance below, which he could seriously have injured himself. So I think that's really impractical and it's not impossible, but it's really impractical. And did I read a suggestion that he might have escaped via the sewers as well? Was, was there a, has, has there been a suggestion of that? It's been suggested he may, gone, he may have escaped by the sewers, but I've yet to find an actual entrance where he could have got into that would have been large enough for him to get down. Uh, why people come up with these ideas, I don't know when it's... Because I think people have got an idea in their, their minds that he just wasn't seen. People weren't looking for anyone. They didn't know there'd been a murder. No one's looking. He could have walked along, just walked out. Part of the problem here, of course, is that people have this idea that the, the, the area was very heavily policed, and it wasn't. Um, P.C. Neil, who, who, yeah, P.C. Neil, who did Bucks, who actually patrolled Bucks Road, also patrolled the Whitechapel Road and the northern part around, and probably the northern part around Queen Anne Street and the, the northern arm of Thomas Street. Um, he also did part of Baker's Row. You then had Constable Meisen, who did the other hut, the other side of, of, of Baker's Row, Hanbury Street and part of Old Montague Street. And at the other end, uh, on Brady Street, you had C Constable Fane, who was doing part of, of that bit and going up and down there. It really wasn't that heavily policed. The police were only around for approximate, looking at the timings that the three police officers are there and they're all on approximately 30 minute beats there's probably about 25 minutes every half hour when there's no police around at all and uh, as you say as well we, we are looking at it with hindsight so we are people look back and say well they would have been on the lookout for him but of course they wouldn't so he could have even walked straight past Meisen was doing knocking up duty wasn't he around baker's row walked straight past him because as, as the, the way i see it is that Meisen wasn't actually particularly bothered about Paul and Cross as they went past him. It was they that approached him. He doesn't appear to have been. Yeah. I mean, his, his beat's interesting because we don't know if he was walking clockwise or counterclockwise. It appears he was coming out of Old Montague, which suggests that he might be heading back up towards, that he might be doing counterclockwise. But of course, as he was knocking up, it could be he had to knock up to do on the corner at exactly 3.45. Can I just add in here that uh, knocking up was waking residents up who had to be up early for work. He was knocking on people's doors, not not another connotation it has. <laughs> yes, quite right, too. No, so it was quite possible that, so we don't know which direction he was walking in. Um, he could have been going clockwise or counterclockwise. It's impossible to say. In PC Fane's case, we, we know that he was walking clockwise because he says he was walking up from the Whitechapel Road up towards the junction with Bucks Row. So that's a clockwise direction. Um, and the same with uh, PC Neil. I mean, PC Neil's going west to east. PC Fane appears to be going south to north sort of thing. Yeah, if he does go to Whitechapel Road, then of course, contrary to what people say about Whitechapel Road, it was quite busy at that time of the morning. You had the wagons coming into the market. You had the Hay Market on Whitechapel High Street. You had Spitalfields Market. So you have all the wagons coming in, all the market traffic is coming in, which is what the coroner says at the inquest, that he could have lost himself in the market traffic. Of course, the other thing is you've got the slaughterhouses are, are, are closing about that time. Uh, and so you've got the slaughtermen going home and they would have been covered in blood as well. Yes. And as PC Neil says himself, when he'd been in... Um, Whitechapel Road some minutes before, it had been quite a busy street. You know, it was quite busy when he was there. He says there was people there. In, in your opinion, which, which one, I mean, I, I know this, this, how long is a piece of string and it's impossible to say, but in your opinion, knowing as much as you do about Bucks Row, and I will put a link through to your wonderful Inside Bucks Row in the uh, comments down below, uh, but in your opinion, which, where do you think he went? If we, if we, make the assumption he's going to take the fastest route, the quickest route out of, of there, then he goes south. 
Um, and he either takes Woods Buildings or he takes Court Street. Thomas Street's a bit further along, and I think it's it's a bit more risky to, to expose himself longer. I think he'd want to be out of sight as soon as possible. That's my personal view. So I would go for Woods Building or Court Street. Either are equally likely in, in my view. But of course, the one thing we haven't considered here is the possibility that he actually just walked the whole vent for Bucks Row itself and just walked out on Bucks Row. So you think he's gone towards the Whitechapel Road? That's that's the, the probable. That's a good option. The other option is that he's gone north towards Baker's Row itself for one of the northern side routes. Yeah, I mean, my personal opinion has always been based, based on what the coroner says. And of course, the coroner had all the information. He'd listened to all the evidence. Uh, he seems to have, uh, his his belief seems to have been that it was the white, he escaped onto Whitechapel Road and lost himself in the early morning market traffic. Yeah, and no one's there looking. I mean, for that actual section of the, the Whitechapel Chapel Road, it's PC Neil, who's actually the, the PC walking along there. Well, he's in Bucks Row almost certainly. Um, no matter which way we look at it, I don't see how PC Neil how the murder can take place when PC Neil is still in Whitechapel Road. It's got to be after he he leaves Whitechapel Road. And of course, look at, looking at uh, Bucks Row today, or uh, Bucks Row is no longer Bucks Row; it's Durwood Street today. But looking at the day, uh, it, of course, it's nothing like it was then. Uh, I've got this. I'll, I'll put the photograph up now. But there's a wonderful photograph that Stuart Evans took of uh, of Bucks Row. Uh, and you really still see that those where, the, the warehouses and uh, I know it's a black and white photograph, but it really ta it's taken during the day, and yet it's still got a darkness. It's almost there's almost a, twi a permanent twilight about it. Yeah, it's now much more open. It's much brighter because of the building materials they've used and the new new constructions there. Um, I think it's looking quite good there now, and you've got the new garden dedicated to Joseph. Eric there as well now further along. I think it's looking very nice down there. Yeah, and it, it's it's uh, and of course the big thing now is that the uh, exit from Whitechapel Station comes out almost along, well, virtually alongside, if not absolutely alongside the murder site. Yes, I mean it literally is there, isn't it? I mean you come out the station, you look down to your right hand side, and that's where poor Marianne was found, literally on the right hand side as you walk out. And then the killer having carried out that murder, uh, my personal belief has always been, and it's a personal belief and nobody can know for certain. So it's one of those, uh, but I think he skirted the board school and then headed off down Woods Buildings. Woods Buildings, I think, would have made the perfect escape. And then he's out onto the Whitechapel Road. And I mean, I think that's, I think that's a very sound idea, Richard. I mean, as I said, either Woods Building or Court Street or at a push, Thomas Street, but that means going further along and exposing yourself to being seen more. Of course, the other option we have to allow for is that he could, have, he could have, if he was a local of Bucks Row, he could have popped into any of the houses. We just don't know. And if you went to Whitechapel High Street, of course, that then leaves the big question, where did he go after that? Uh, because, and then we come into the endless suspect. Uh, <laughs> did, he go, did he go towards the city? Did he go uh, further east towards St. George in the east? Did he head down the Mile End Road? Uh, he's got so many places he could have gone after that. And of course, the whole area is riddled with alleyways. Or did he just head south? He could have just, just he headed south down towards um, Burner Street, Pinchin Street, the Tower of London. He could have ended up that way, going around that way. There's no way of knowing. I mean, any of those are possible. Or even headed into the grounds of the London Hospital opposite and uh, lost himself in the, in the grounds of London Hospital. Because, of course, the, uh, we know from Emma Elizabeth Smith and the attack on her, we know that the outpatients was open four o'clock in the morning so per, maybe ducked into the out of course this is all speculation now uh but it, it it's one of those things once you start tugging at those threads then uh i i personally am in agreement with you that whitechapel road and, and of course the coroner whitechapel road was his escape destination hmm. I mean, the whole point is that if a killer walks uh, walks towards the West, he's, he's, he will be out of sight within 30 seconds, 50 seconds of anyone coming up behind because it's so close to the board school. He will be out of sight if he turns south there, then he can go anywhere he, he, he wants. And no one will ever see him or know he's there. Well, Steve, it's been wonderful talking to you. Uh, 
so I think we've given people something to uh, ponder on then. We've got all the maps that uh, people go. You've got lots of maps in Inside Bucks Row as well, so people can study the maps. Yes, there's individual. There's a chapter which is just about the possible escape routes with individual maps and distances for every of for all of the possible escape routes that we've mentioned. The only thing we've got to find out then is were there any sewers around there? <laughs> yes, <laughs> there were some, but I don't think they were large enough. So I think it was a film I saw. I, I, I can't remember where I've seen this, but uh, it, might, it might have been a film. It might have been, it might have been a newspaper article at the time because you know you read articles and you think, "Oh, that's interesting," and then. And then you sort of struggle to remember, where did I read that? <laughs> but uh, I, I know certainly I've read that he made use of the sewers uh, to get away. But that might have been a film that I saw it in. Possibly, possibly. I mean, one of the favourite one, yeah, one of those that's discussed quite often is it that he, you know, he gets down the district line and walks along the railway line into the, to the tunnel and walks out that way. Well, yeah, I just don't see it personally. Steve, it's been great talking to you. You've certainly given us something to think about. So uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Richard.